Okay, Good folks, job. here we go. Welcome to the summertime. I hope you're sitting near, near a pool somewhere or down by a beach. That's where I'm going to be most of the summer. So uh, here we go. Before we get started with a little bit of uh, physics, I just want to stress the importance of finding a physics buddy. Please don't tackle the summer assignment by yourself. That will be boring. Find someone that you know and like and who is in the physics course and uh, get used to working together. This is how you're going to uh, survive college, by the way, working together in teams. So find your physics buddy, do some physics every day, a little bit at a time, and you'll be fine for the course. So uh, here we go. This phrase, relativity, sometimes intimidates people. It's nothing to be upset about. We're going to talk a little bit about motion, and then we're going to talk about how you need coordinate systems to uh, describe motion. When we use the phrase relative, what, whoops, there we go. When we use the phrase relative, what we mean is that a measurement that is made depends upon the frame of reference in which you make it. Here we have a young man drinking a cup of coffee, speeding down the highway. So this is great. There's the cup, there's the mouth. No problem. If this same man tried to take that cup of coffee and pass it to an observer on the sidewalk, that cup of coffee would smash the person into the face. That would be bad. So the question becomes, is the cup of coffee moving or is the cup of coffee not moving? If it were moving, he would be getting hot coffee all over himself. For the person on the side of the road, if it were not moving, then the person on the side of the road could drink it. So the only way to answer the question of whether or not the cup of coffee is moving is to first say, with respect to what frame of reference are we trying to decide is the cup of coffee moving or not? Are we talking about a reference frame just inside the car? Well, if this is my reference frame, clearly the cup is not moving. But if we're talking about a reference frame that includes the bystander on the side of the road, now we can say relative to the bystander, the cup of coffee goes zooming past. So once again, an observer on the side, uh, this of course is Albert Einstein, uber genius. Here comes our gentleman with the coffee in the car, wiping out Albert. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> So again, whether or not something is moving all comes down to the frame of reference that you choose to describe. Look, that time went away. What we're going to have to do is to learn how to establish frames of reference. In order to do that, we need coordinate systems. This is a traditional Cartesian coordinate system, sometimes called rectangular coordinate, sometimes called orthogonal coordinate systems. I usually just call it a Cartesian coordinate system. It's a traditional XY. You do this in math all the time. There's your x, there's your, there's your y, there's your point in space. Here's your origin, your 0, 0. So I would go 1, 2, 3, that would be a 3. And then I go 1, 2, 3, that would be a 3. And you've done this a thousand times in math class. The only thing that's going to be a little bit different in physics is that it's just not about numbers. What we're doing all the time is making measurements. In the case of the moving car, maybe I want to say, let's plot the position of the car as time passes. Now this is going to confuse some people because suddenly this is an x-axis. This is an axis that has a name. It's called the ordinate axis. That way I can put any variable here that I want. I want to describe horizontal position, so I'm going to put that on the ordinate. Down here on the abscissa, I'm going to put time. This is going to be measured in seconds. This is going to be measured in meters. So that now I can establish a coordinate system where I'm going to keep track of the moving car. Its position in the horizontal as time passes. Please don't be upset by this. This is not math class. It is physics class. Gone is the old-fashioned x, y. This is no useless. Now we have a real graph 
that's going to give us information which you'll learn about in a subsequent lecture. Here we have a three-dimensional coordinate system. Notice, for your sake, one more time, a little x, a little y. For three dimensions, we call it z. Of course, there would be a negative y and a negative x. And going into the plane of the board would be your negative z. So positive z comes out towards you. Negative z goes into the plane of whatever surface it is we're talking about. This axis is still called the abscissa. This axis is the ordinate. And we will leave it up to you to discover the name of the Z axis. We have another type of coordinate system that you may not be familiar with. This is a polar coordinate system. Instead of using x's and y's, we're going to say establish a 0, 0, just like you normally would. But now, the point in space that's being described is going to be described by two values. One of the values, which we label theta, is measured from this abscissa, and we go counterclockwise. The other is going to be labeled r, and we draw a direct line from the origin to the point in space being described, r and theta. So instead of a Cartesian coordinate system, which would describe an x and a y, we have an r measured direct from the origin, and we have theta. Theta always measured counterclockwise from the positive abscissa. Here we have polar coordinate system. Here we have a traditional Cartesian coordinate system. Yes, you need to be able to go back and forth. If I go ahead and make up a good old x and y like this, and have a point in space like that, clearly I could count off a certain number of units in the x, and then a certain number of units in the y. So there's the y. There's the x, nicely done, exactly, beautiful. Or I could say, again, polar coordinates are direct. Let's see if this will work. Ha, ah, look at that. R, and then this is very poor technique, crossing lines. It will be deducting points for you. There's my theta. Come on, theta. Yeah, see how poor a technique that is? Do as I say, guys. I'll do it. Three. Four. There's my Cartesian coordinate pair. There's the R. There's the theta. I have an x and a y, I have an r and a theta. This is 37 degrees. I know, know you know what that is. The last thing I'm going to show you, and this is going to take you into the next lesson, is a way of describing directions using a shorthand technique called the unit vector. Here is a three-dimensional coordinate system. So you would want to label this x and y and z. I'm going to take a ray, and I just completely messed that up. I'm going to take a ray and draw it one unit long and I'm going to label it I and I'm going to take a ray and I'm going to label it J in the, in the Y direction and then I'm going to take another ray 
and label it K in the Z direction. And the way you're normally going to see these written will be like this, I, J, K. I called these rays because that's the phrase you're familiar with. In physics, we actually call them vectors. A unit vector shows direction. I corresponds to the X direction. J corresponds to the Y direction. And K corresponds to the Z direction. This is a very simple technique for showing direction without having to say five meters in the X direction, two meters in the Y direction. Instead, you can simply say things like two meters, two I meters. And I know that I'm going in the positive X direction. If I say minus three J meters, I know that would mean, oh look, J direction is like this, but minus is that way. So I would go down three. Good luck. Find your physics buddy. Have a great summer. All right, I'm done. Sorry it took so long.